Today we have an um, amazing person uh, that is agreed to share uh, his experience with us. Before we get to that, quick intro about Made4 and who we are. So Made4 is a customer experience learning organization, and we believe that we have quite a unique approach to how we do things. Uh, so not so many organizations actually see customer experience as an integrated discipline. And that means that we uh, provide learning in a very wide range of um, um, topics, including digital product management and also service design and customer experience strategy and customer science even. Um, we do it through the immersive boot camps and uh, it's all based uh, on real life cases and we have quite a good uh, pool, uh, pool of uh, experts to help learners really to acquire those skills. Um, and our goal is really to move um, customer experience discipline to the next professional level. And we do also quite a bit of defining that standard and developing tools and methodologies. Super quick one. Here's the uh, QR code if you are looking for a website, but I will not keep that longer away from our today's guest speaker, Nate Brown. So, um, Nate will be talking today about capturing the loyalty uh, of the modern customer. And I think we all have um, interest in that. That's why we have joined. So uh, for, um, for those who may not know Nate, he is a senior director of customer experience at Arise. He is also co-founder of customer experience or CX Accelerator and general CX royalty, as we say. <laughs> Hardly. Um, well, uh, Nate's uh, name is um, always uh, kind of mentioned when we uh, look up a customer experience, and therefore, I think it's not. Uh, let's not be modest on on really honoring that. Um, Nate started uh, as a customer support specialist back in two thousand eight, and today uh, he can be seen teaching, advising, and helping large corporates and influential businesses adopt change to better both and to uh, improve and better both employee and customer experiences. Okay, no no more minutes wasted, Nate, floor is yours. Thank you for uh, being here. We are super excited. Cheers, well, thank you, Agnes, and thank you, David. I, I was drawn immediately to Made4 because uh, the, the mission of CX Accelerator is to admonish and to edify CX professionals on their career journey. And so me and Agnes hit it off right away uh, just given her heart and her and her mind for this work, and uh, I just I just love everything that you all are doing. So it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, let's play a quick game. Let's see if anybody can figure out where where Nate is from. Uh, I've got a I've got a mandolin over there. I do live in America. Uh, put it in the chat if you got it. I love hot chicken. Uh, Dolly Parton is to the east of me, but no, oh Carol Carol got it. Nashville. Well done. What what gave it away, Carol? I love it. Oh, Matt Lyles knows. Oh, Matt, Matt's in Nashville too. Good to see you, Matt. Oh, great to have you on here. That's awesome. Uh, well, yeah, thank you all so much for, for having me. I love our, our international scope of this community. I really feel like the CX field is special in, in the regard of the fact that we come together. We speak such a common language. We're so giving of, of the knowledge that we collect in this space. And we do so much to encourage each other. And, and really at the end of the day, what we're helping to do is, is take stress and friction out of people's lives. If, if we do CX really well, it does enhance life for our customers. And when we do that well together, it's just awesome to see. Oh yeah, I do have my, uh, I was telling David, if anybody knows Krispy Kreme, uh, so they put on their hot light. And so I call that my CX hot light. Whenever I'm talking about CX, I go and I turn on my little, my personal CX hot light over there. Uh, so very good. Well, let, let's jump in here. So I do have uh, a handful of slides, but we just love, you know, any questions you have, please pop those into the chat. You know, I'm going to keep that chat window open. We'd love to see those. And we do have some time at the end as well. Uh, but do, do not hesitate even to come off mute. If, if you have a, a comment you really want to make, would love to, would love to hear that. I, I think one person uh, would be, would be good to, to meet right now, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the title of this is capturing the loyalty of the modern customer. And, and the reason that I use that title, I do feel like our target is shifted, right? I mean, it's, it's crazy how much has changed in the work of CX, even in the past couple of years. 
and and the expectations the mentality of our customer has shifted and so we we get to catch up a little bit um it is agnes brilliantly has already stated i won't hash this anymore but uh, i i will add that i'm a, a terrible dancer but i'm a pretty good pickleball player so i'll kick your butt in some pickleball but i, I will not challenge you to a dance battle and uh, for anybody that will be at ccw vegas I will be there dancing uh, terribly and exuberantly. I apologize in advance for, for what will happen there. I love that show. Uh, so we have customer experience, which I love the Forrester definition. I know there's a lot out there, but the thoughts and perceptions that customers have towards a brand. So, I mean, we're dealing in a very left and right brain scenario here. I mean, it's thoughts and feelings and perceptions. There's a lot of, guess what, psychology that is that is under the surface here. I mean, psychology is the scientific study of the mind and behavior. <laughs> so I mean, both of those key words really lend itself well to customer experience because we're trying to understand the thoughts and perceptions and then guide the customer towards the desired outcome, the behavior that we want to see, whether that's loyalty, whether that's increased share of wallet. So I mean, really what we're doing, in my opinion, is a form of psychology. And, and that's, that's good. That's a great thing for us to understand and realize and stop treating the surface level stuff. Stop only dealing in the behavior area and start thinking about the mind area <laughs> as we do this work. So let's unpack the mind of CX a little bit. I'm going to cover these five areas. There are more, but we have 35 minutes together and we're going to, we're going to cover these relatively quickly, but these are all critical and uh, will we'll help to get, at least give us a foundation for the mindset here. So, I mean, of course, let, let's start with strategy. I mean, in the beginning, we wanna have a vision of where we're going with the experience that we wanna design. So CX is a few things and it's not a few things. And, and I feel like there's been some great commentary on LinkedIn recently that's kind of debated this to some degree. Uh, but in my opinion, CX really is not a program or initiative. In fact, it can be very dangerous when we start to start to use that language. You, you might remember that brilliant article that came out from Bob Thompson on Customer Think a couple of years ago that suggested that like 93% of CX programs fail to demonstrate meaningful value. And if we look at it as a program, yeah, it is doomed to fail. <laughs> because a program has what? A finish line. And th this work does not have a finish line. We're dealing with the thoughts and feelings and emotions of people towards our company. There's no finish line to that. This is more like a mentality. It's more like a way of doing things. I mean, that's my favorite definition of culture. It's the way we do things. So if we want to be in a customer centric culture, then the way we do things is we're going to treat our customers really well <laughs> and in the form of like an ongoing revolution on the way we think about and treat our customers. And so it, it can't be everything though, because if it's everything, it's, it's gonna be nothing. And I, I've been in the room with so many executives that have given lip service to CX and just didn't pinpoint anything though. Didn't, didn't give us anything that we could latch onto in terms of changing our mentality or our behaviors towards our customers. So therefore it was meaningless. It was meaningless, meaningless lip service. So how can we make it something something we can grab onto and, and start to really mobilize the organization and unify the organization towards something meaningful. Well, I love this definition from Maven Insights when we think about strategy. It's changing the mindset of the organization and collectively adapting to deliver the desired experience. <laughs> what, what a great way to think about CX. We're, we're adapting to deliver a desired experience. And, and so in order for us to do that, we'd have to know what that desired experience looks like. Maybe we do today, maybe we don't. <laughs> but it's really important that we do have some clarity, some, some idea, some unified concept of what that desired experience actually looks like. Then we can start to change the mindset of the organization and ultimately the behavior. So great job to Maven Insights for calling out those critical elements. So if we think about a CX strategy and breaking it away from those terms of initiative or program, but this is, this is a lasting change that we want to implement into the business. Nobody talks about it better than John Coder in, in his brilliant work of leading change. And, and that begins with establishing a sense of urgency. <laughs> People don't change 
because you, you sent an email out. They don't change because you sent 20 emails out. They don't change because you had an all hands on deck meeting once a quarter and, and said that CX was important. That, that doesn't light the fire under anyone. So there has to be some kind of fuel, some agent that lights a fire and makes people desire to change. So, I mean, that could be a number of things in, in the world of CX terminology. It could be that you're losing market share toward, towards your competitors because they're doing this well. <laughs> they are honoring your customers. They are innovating in this area of customer experience and they're gobbling up market share. And you're realizing if we're gonna survive here, we've got to do this. <laughs> we've got to crack this CX nut better than we're doing it today. Or maybe it's a representation of a tremendous opportunity to fulfill the mission of your organization in a way that you're not doing today. Maybe there's a toxic culture that's creeping in. And by, by viewing things differently and through a more customer centric lens together, you can start to create the type of work environment that you want to be there for and start to retain your top talent. These are ways, these are languages that we can speak to insert that sense of urgency. Some of it's mathematical, proving the ROI of the work. Here's how we can protect and gain market share. Other of it's going to be a little bit more empirical on that, that right brain side of this is how we can create a better I'm working environment where we want to have our top talent involved. So establishing urgency is that first step there. Then CX Change Coalition. <laughs> I'm sure many of you maybe, maybe were like me. The first thing I tried to do as a CX professional when I was awarded that CX title inside of an organization where I'd worked for many years, which may, maybe wasn't the best thing because I was, I was desperate to prove myself. And so I tried to absorb all CX activity into me. And, and that was an instant killer of the work. I mean, I in, instantly became a bottleneck and, and I couldn't see it at the time, but that was the worst possible way to un, unlock CX inside of the organization, which is exactly what we're trying to do. We as a CX leader or CX team can't do CX on behalf of the organization. That's impossible. What we're trying to do is unlock and unfurl CX inside of every team in a way that is both distinctive inside of that touch point and consistent in terms of the overall desired experience that we talked about before. <laughs> so it, it's unifying, but then also bringing some personification, some personality, some personalization to each of these different touch points in a way that's going to make sense for that team in that department. In order to do that, you have to have a strong CX change coalition that represents those different functional areas that can take things back and inspire their teams to do these things, make it a priority for them intrinsically and not some CX team telling them what to do, but them trying to solve their big problems by using customer centric principles, which if we, if we do our jobs well, it's very easy to prove. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what the problem is. Great CX will help to solve that problem. We, we just have to change the way that we bring it to them. I, I believe that curiosity is one of the most underused forces that we have as CX professionals. We have these different arrows in our quiver, right? As CX pros. And I think the, the journey map is certainly one that we like to pull out <laughs> a lot. It is great. You know, it's really effective because it forces people to, to look through the lens of the customer. But another, another arrow to be pulling out quick is curiosity. Hey, what if, what if we tried this together? You know, I've heard some customer feedback here. I'm not sure yet. I think we need to collect some more customer feedback, but what if we A, B test this? What if we take this group of customers and do this thing? We take this group of customers and do this thing. Let's see which one creates a better experience for them. Let's see if that helps to solve this friction point that we've identified in the business and, and get them being like, yeah, yeah, I wonder. And, and get them with some skin in the game to where they wanna help solve the puzzle. <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem. It should be a puzzle because people love solving puzzles. Think about why people go fishing. <laughs> it's just a giant puzzle. Where are the fish? What are they eating today? What's the weather conditions? What lure do I throw out? Do I need to go buy worms? How can I get to the fish quietly? Like it's just, there's so many variables and people love to go fishing because it, it's just solving the puzzle. And 90% and of people, they catch the fish and throw it back in. Hey, I solved the puzzle. I did it. I'm going to take a picture with my cell phone, show it to my son, and I'm off. And, and that's kind of the curiosity that we can develop here inside of CX because people love to solve a complicated puzzle. 
So David Walsh, do you find that uh, bigger buy-in conversations to the wider, wider organization is a hard one to begin? Uh, yeah, I mean, so that's where having a clear and definitive sense of urgency is important and unifying people together on, we have to change together and here's why. If there's not a, a clear why statement about why CX is so important and why you all need to do it together, it is inevitable that your CX, I'm, I'm gonna use the dirty word, program will fail. <laughs> uh, was there another comment there from uh, Liasan or from David? Okay, very good. Yeah, great question, David, I love that question. And then, and then our job is ultimately to remove barriers. I mean, I, I was just at the CCW Executive Exchange in Chicago, and I was so encouraged at, at the ability for people to find friction and go set up like task forces to go eliminate friction. This was in travel, this was in retail, this was in healthcare. <laughs> a lot of them represented a healthcare, like a patient experience function. They were all together finding friction and eliminating friction. So I, I started using the word friction fighters and, and kind of coining this code of the friction fighter around what that is. So, I mean, that's kind of a cool way to unite different groups of people of, we're gonna bring peace and harmony into this situation. We're going to take some stress out of this. We're going to go fight friction together and unifying people using that terminology is it, pretty cool and exciting. Okay. So I'm going to do this real quick, but I mean, this is a great exercise. Look it up on HBR. If you do not know yet what the desired experience is, you can't define it yet. And you're not using the same words together or, or to David's point, maybe these big level conversations are too hard right now. It's because the brand core isn't clear. The brand core is what do we promise and what are the core values that sum up what our brand stands for? You cannot understand the desired experience unless that brand core is popping off the page for you and everybody in the business. And it's an overflow of the internal clarity from knowing your culture, knowing what you're good at, your competencies, and having a true mission and vision. It's not just plastered on a wall somewhere, but that people actually know and it's in their heart to some degree. That then starts to be represented externally. <laughs> How are we gonna use the things that we're really good at, this unique culture that we've built together, this tribe we've created? How can we now go and do something for our communities and our customers that nobody else can do? What is that thing that we're gonna promise that we're gonna do for them? And you have to know what that is. And then who belongs to us? How do we position that value? How do we position ourselves in the marketplace? Who are our customers? We cannot be all things to all people. We should not try. There's a group of people out there that we can serve really well, and we should go find them. And an effective marketing team will help you position yourself to where you can deliver on that promise really well to a group of people. And that's how businesses grow through a great CX mentality and understanding their brand core and delivering on that promise, because that's what CX does. And that's why marketing and CX are overlapping so much, because it used to be the company would just go out and make promises. And it didn't matter much if those promises were delivered on or not. But now that the voice of customer is so strong <laughs> and we live in the age of the customer, we don't get to, to make up who we are as a business. It's for what one customer says to another. That's our brand promise. <laughs> They're dictating to us to a large degree our own reputation. So, I mean, it's up to us to understand that, get into their mentality using voice of customer capability and then to be able to deliver on that promise that we're putting out into the world. That's where great, consistent CX comes from. And that's how loyalty today is earned. So let, let's look at voice of customer. We tell the customer story with integrity. I've, I see way too much. <laughs> I can't think of a better word, so I'm, I'm going to say I, I'm not going to say that word. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I see too much manipulation of voice of customer data to where there's a bias that was formed, maybe by a product team or a powerful group inside of the organization. Gene Bliss talks about the power core inside of the organization. Maybe that power core is leveraging voice of customer in a way that does not actually tell the customer story. They're perpetuating a bias or a desire. We as CX professionals stand in the gap. <laughs> we, we protect the sanctity of the voice of customer. We protect the integrity of that. Oftentimes, it's incredibly inconvenient. Oftentimes, we don't understand it. It's not clear what the customer is saying. And that's why we have to work harder and go deeper to understand 
We don't wipe it away. We don't forget about it. We don't oversimplify it into a clean agenda point that already already was what we wanted it to say. No, we have to go deeper and find. So how do, how do we find it? Well, for me, I mean, this a, a great voice of customer engine starts with with being able to truly go deeper into the mentality of the customer. So I like to do like a listening path map to understand the structured and unstructured channel on every touch point. What, what are the ways that our customers are talking about us today? Do we have the ability to inherit that data into a centralized engine? If we don't, then that's, that's a gap. We don't understand our customer today, at least not fully. So it begins with isolating our gaps and our ability to listen. And, and, and depicting those visually for our executives so that we can build out the voice of customer engine, then we can really get going. <laughs> then we can do journey maps, not hypothesis maps. Then we can start to really understand our personas and what their definition of success looks like. Then we can start to really take that VOC data and use it in really good and creative ways. But oftentimes the VOC engine isn't there and we, and we still try to make the road trip together with the customer, but we don't make it to the destination because the engine wasn't powerful enough. So there's a lot of legwork that needs to be done first in this VOC area before we jump in and start trying to make changes. <laughs> Do we really understand the mentality of our customer before we start trying to change their behaviors? This is just a quick example of a journey map that I like to build out. I keep them really simple needs and expectations, the pain points. And I like to show very distinctly how the expectations upstream in the journey become pain points downstream and how that impacts the data points that we're measuring. Uh, so that's that's how I like to do the, the journey map there. So what are the data points that we would be measuring? Well, I feel like our metrics uh, are, are back in 15, 20 years ago stage in terms of the psychology of the customer and our ability to really understand them for many of us, not for all of us, but we want to make sure that we're using metrics that matter, that, that demonstrate a truth, that demonstrate an ability for us to get closer to our customer's mindset so that we can then ultimately change our behaviors and hopefully change their behaviors in the form of loyalty. So what, what are some of these things that we would use? Well, I mean, you've probably seen the surge of customer success that has taken hold and customer success, they're doing like co composite metrics around customer health score, customer engagement score, you've probably heard. And so that's taking the lens of the customer and viewing their engagement across that entire journey and, and attributing whether it's customer sentiment or other values of usage and capability there, just really being able to demonstrate engagement throughout the journey and then rolling that up into an overall customer health score. And then taking that, grouping together these different accounts in different areas, different sizes, different personas, and being able to view on a more macro level, the health of our customers here, the health of our customers in this product set, in, in the health of our customers that are small to medium business. You know, having that lens and that mentality is so powerful. It's hard to measure, but you know, with, with Gainsight and other really powerful tools that give us those capabilities, it's awesome what we can do now that goes so much deeper than what we used to do in the area of voice of customer. Customer lifetime value, it's, it's tricky to measure. There's different ways to do it, but we wanna be able to show as a CX professional, as we serve our customers better, are we unlocking share of wallet and are we extending the length that this relationship lasts? <laughs> Is it a higher quality relationship and a longer relationship? We need to be able to identify that and show that in some way. And then I love Gene Bliss's uh, customer growth engine. It, it's simply representing the total volume and value of your customers on a quarterly basis. So that way you're showing, are we growing our customer engine or not? Are we valuing our customers and making decisions to where this asset, this greatest asset we have of our customer, it's growing sustainably. And, and just looking at it in whole numbers, instead of hiding behind different hypothetical percentages and things like that. I mean, it just puts the fish on the dish in such a clear and compelling way. So that's how I kick off my CX dashboard is a customer growth engine metric. Hey, here's all the stuff we're doing. This is the result. <laughs> Our customers went up, the value of them went down. Now let's, now let's layer in, let's figure out, okay, what, what's going on here? with this group of customers, this group of customers, and then using it like a customer health score, or customer engagement score, it's so powerful um, to be able to do that. 
And then customer sentiment. I mean, it's just taken over uh, our, when we think about customer support, customer service specifically in, in that lens, I mean, it's amazing how critical th this part really is for us. Uh, I mean, customer sentiment is just measuring how somebody felt about a thing. <laughs> we can ask that question so freely and across different touch points and in different ways, and we can inherit the data on that question so so loosely. I mean, it's it's so unstructured and powerful how we can bring that into our centralized VOC engine using mobile devices so effectively with with text and voice, even video, <laughs> being able to take sentiment through facial expression and other things. Uh, through third party locations, pulling it in off reviews and, and comments on Discord and forums like Reddit and things like that. Bringing this stuff in is, is such a, an important capability that's there. Um, great question from, from uh, Niall. So is CLV right for every brand? No. <laughs> no, I mean, so that, that's going to be uh, more of a B2B situation where you're trying to extend the depth and longevity of the customer relationship. So, I mean, that's not going to make sense in a lot of B2C formats. Um, so that's a great question. And thank you for, for calling that out. But yeah, customer sentiment, on the other hand, everybody has a use for that in, in terms of being able to measure how people feel about you in a product or service or interaction throughout that journey. It's so comparable to different parts of the customer journey across the entire thing. Great stuff. So that, that's the, the metrics part how can we we can understand the mentality of the customer now where do these behaviors change <laughs> so where where we use voice of customer more than anything is in the lives of our employees it, it's creating that employee experience that then rebounds and and creates a depiction of the customer experience that we want them to be creating if, if they don't have that gift to give they're not going to give it they can't certainly not consistently so we're, we're taking that VOC capability, we're taking that VOE, voice of employee, structured and unstructured feedback, and we're designing that experience first. So why, why is it, psychology again, why do people work? <laughs> well, it's play purpose potential, primed to perform by Neil Doshi and Lindsay McGregor as the greatest work on this topic that I've ever seen since Daniel Pink's Drive. And I really feel like they've modernized the principles of drive to, to our current generation. So I mean, play is not throwing a ping pong table and having a pizza party every month. It's 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 deeper than that. It's it's having a sense of curiosity and excitement about the work itself. <laughs> it's going much deeper and and making the work exciting, making it a puzzle, <laughs> unlocking that curiosity component that we talked about before. And then in that process of solving that puzzle, they're doing something that that matters. That resolution does matter. In, in terms of the ways that we're serving our communities and our customers. And then I'm getting to become the person I want to become through that cycle. I'm growing. I am capable of more. I am able to see that growth and reflect on that growth. That's how we attract and retain the absolute best talent is creating an environment where these, these psychological levers are taking place. There's a whole another side of it, of the negative ones. And that's like social pressure where people have become a victim of their own jobs which happens a lot more often than you think for a whole bunch of different reasons. Then you have economic factors where they feel locked into a job. They're trapped in their own job. Then you have inertia, <laughs> which is the most dangerous of all, which every organization has some level of inertia where they're just doing things because they've done it that way. They've lost the ability to be curious and to innovate. And they're going on a track that is not serving people well. And having the courage and capability to see that and make a change to serve people better it's a special thing to have that in your culture. This is a huge problem. This is a big part of why there's so much friction in the employee experience. And it's the fact that we have way too many tools. The average enterprise organization has 464 applications inside of it that you're actively using. <laughs> and almost 40% of those are customer facing. We're trying to get our customers to use all this stuff too. No wonder the data is all over the place. No wonder self-service doesn't work when information is trapped inside of all this stuff. We have agents spending between 30 minutes and two hours every day hunting for information that's trapped inside of a person or a system that's relegated out to some corner because there's too many tools. <laughs> so, I mean, people are getting burned out from this. I mean, G2 Crowd says that more than half, half of employees are unhappy at work because of the software they're using. I mean, that should just be table stakes, right? 
I mean, let's focus on the hard stuff, <laughs> like actually figuring out how to create a great experience instead of just trying to figure out the tools we're using inside of the company and, and all the friction with, with trying to hunt and, and peck for data. Uh, so, I mean, that's a huge thing that we need. We just need to simplify our tool sets and think about knowledge curation. That, that is the one thing that I feel like impacts employee experience and customer experience simultaneously more than anything else that I, that I work on is an effective knowledge curation strategy because knowledge breathes life into everybody's experience. It just makes everything so much better and easier for people to achieve their jobs. And, and I love Leslie Oflehaven and Jenny Dempsey. They, ha they have that brilliant hashtag of free to serve. Let's just be asking and thinking, are our people free to serve in the ways that they want to serve? Can they even achieve the desired experience that we talked about in the beginning? <laughs> or are they, are they not able to because of all the hurdles and all the ways that we've trapped them into these little boxes in terms of their skills and capabilities, the knowledge they can see, uh, all the hurdles in the experience for them, they're going to be hurdles for the customer as well. And, and in those cases, they are, they are not free to serve. So I'm going to accelerate a little bit here just in the interest. I do want to mention this. So I love... When we think about the employee experience and being able to focus well on the customer experience, it, it's all about a circle of trust. And Simon Sinek talks about this so well. We, we don't win with the sharpness of our sword. We, we win with the strength of our shields and the ability for us to lock in together and fight outward towards our competition instead of towards each other. Because that's where the vast majority of organizations are stuck in. They're stuck fighting each other and in a self-preservation mode. Some organizations of the past intentionally created that environment of cannibalistic energy, <laughs> and it does not lend itself at all to a good customer experience. You're, you're unable physically, mentally to focus outward if you are focused inward on yourself and your own protection. <laughs> so by creating a circle of trust around one another inside of our teams, it gives us the capability to focus on the desired experience and think about how we can deliver that together. But unless that's in place, our conversation around CX is literally irrelevant because the circle of trust is broken. People will have to focus on self-preservation and CX will not be relevant until the circle is reestablished. So, I mean, that is your number one priority as a CX leader. If you feel like that circle has been compromised and you shouldn't have to guess at it, you should know because of your voice of employee capability and your program there. You should know how people feel about the circle of trust. And if you don't, then you get to start there. <laughs> so it's finding that friction inside the house. We have tool friction. We have customer friction. Expectations are so high and customers are behaving really poorly right now. There's been so many examples of abusive customers. We have to protect our people from our own customers in ways I've never dreamed of. So, I mean, that's really important. And then heart friction <laughs> it's that idea of that circle of trust being around them can can i extend my heart outward <laughs> or am i just trying to pump blood into my own body right now because that's all i can do that's all i can do right now so it's finding those friction points and unlocking that so that people can be free to serve all right so i i know i have um only a, a few minutes and i want to get into q a uh this this is a good we're kind of moving into the finish line here around the psychology of cx just to put a bow on it uh, so I love Denise Yon. <laughs> and if you haven't read Denise Yon, she is my, my top favorite CX author. Uh, Jean Bliss would be right behind there, but uh, there's a lot of great ones out there. Uh, but Denise Yon and her book, Fusion, it did change my life. I mean, I was stuck in a really bad situation. That book gave me the courage to move forth in my career in a way that I did not yet have the courage to do. So I'm very grateful to, to her and to that book. But uh, customers are more savvy today they see advertising rhetoric for what it is. They no longer accept brands at face value. They're skeptical about the claims that companies make. So again, we don't get to tell our customers who we are. They're telling us and they're telling each other. They want authenticity, brands that live up to their promises and stated ideals. Have we stated these things? Have we stated what the desired experience looks like? Have we stated our brand core? in terms of who we are and, and what we behave like. <laughs> of those stated ideals that we're giving life upward from and, and ex extending out into our customers and in our community in terms of this is how we serve you. This is the promise that we're gonna take a stand up for. Uh, so, I mean, if those things aren't established and then delivered on authentically, 
loyalty will not be yours, not in this age and time. Customers expect too much, and, and some companies are doing it so well that they will be rewarded with that loyalty that we so desire. But it can be done. It can be done. It just it takes it takes time and it takes intentionality to build this psychological foundation to where we think differently about this work, think differently about our customers, and think differently about our employees. Yes, thank you, Agnes, for that wonderful quote from Richard Branson. Uh, that is so, so true. Um, so, I mean, this is just kind of a quick, I mean, as I was wrestling through this with my, with my wife and trying to figure out where were we going to apply our loyalty in terms of being a customer, <laughs> and, and she made this brilliant statement. She's like, it's so hard to know what to do with our life, our time, and our money. And I was like, freeze frame. I mean, that right there, uh, that is so brilliant because that that is that is how the modern customer thinks. What, how, what do I do with my life? My how are we supporting organizations that are making life better for people in the way that we see that happening? Because people see that differently than, than other folks. <laughs> so we want to support organizations that see that the same way we see that with their stated ideals. Then my time is very important. Don't waste my time. Don't, don't have information trapped <laughs> so that I can't use your self-service. Don't have your agent spending two hours looking for information and, sitting, and having me sit there waiting for something that should be immediate. Don't, don't hassle me, <laughs> make it easy for me. And then my money, it does have to represent a good value. But th this is the way that so many of our customers think today, life, time, and money. Are, are you thinking about it that way as an organization? And then I, I love to close with the, the brilliant words of, of Donald Miller in building a story brand. So he, he talks about how in this story that we're we're building as CX professionals, and we are storytellers, aren't we? Uh, but we we're, we're building a, a story brand. We're serving our community in this compelling way. But we aren't the hero of the story. It's actually the customer that's the hero of the story, and we get to be the guide for them, which is such a cool role. And we get to be Katniss, Yoda, Dumbledore, Gandalf, whatever it is for you. Put yourself in that mentality of I'm going to understand what my customer's definition of success looks like, and I'm going to guide them there very intimately, very effectively. I'm going to make it so easy for them. I'm going to bring them farther than they could have ever gone by themselves. And I'm going to be proactive in, in thinking through what do they need to know? What hurdles are they going to face next so that I can effectively guide them and circumvent those challenges and help them to achieve their success in the best way and most accelerated way? Uh, so I love that that metaphor of being the guide and also just that mentality of having the customer be the hero of the story. So I'll, I'll close with that. I would love to be a resource for you. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. That, that is my cell phone text number. So if you want to brainstorm on something, uh, don't hesitate to shoot me a text or, or find me on LinkedIn and shoot me a message there. And, and also CX Accelerator, you know, jump into CX Accelerator. It's a free nonprofit community. We just want you there so that we can encourage you and, and build up this work together. Well, back to, back to Agnes and David. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Nate. That was fantastic. Um, really appreciate you sharing this. And I love the, the kind of the overarching theme of curiosity. And, and I think that's super important in every aspect of customer experience. If you have a data set at hand to actually spend your time a bit thinking deeper, th asking the right questions, asking more questions, ask more questions just, and you, by searching the uh, answers, you already get uh, more questions. And, and that I think is uh, critical indeed to unlock some insights and unlock kind of understanding of customer. Thank you so much. So anyone, uh, we have like literally a minute left. So I will give oh, one I'm question so a chance. <laughs> My fault. No worries. Um, Matt, do you, did you kind of wave a, wanting to say something no 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 okay so any any anyone else um wants to ask questions yeah i'll have a stab um so thinking about the fact that it's crucial now for brands to really take cx seriously and the authenticity required for bringing your customer in closer to your heart what drives you as a business all of that stuff mm. we might do you feel that we might move into a space where the authenticity just goes because every brand believes that they need and must just grab any cause going to get their customers to believe in them? There will be a lot of brands that just reach out and, and some marketing department will make up some set of stated ideals that has not actually inserted itself into the hearts and minds of their employees. 
And, and that's where that CX component will, will enter in because we won't be delivering on the promise that the business is making. <laughs> They're not going to represent that personality that they say they are. And so that's why it's so cool that the customer has all the power today <laughs> because they will be revealed so quickly <laughs> in, in third-party environments for, for the fraud that they are in terms of this, this company says they're this, they're not this at all. Here's what they actually do. And the, and the customer has way more credibility than the business itself <laughs> in terms of those statements that it's making. So we have to earn, we have to earn our reputation. We have to earn our stated ideals by living them out. So only the best companies will do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. We are really Great out questions. of time. I'm just launching a quick uh, poll. Um, thank you again. Nate, and thank you everyone for joining and spending um, a bit of time together. I hope it was valuable for you. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, including Nate, myself. Um, and I hope to see you again in our next talks. And yeah, have a good uh, evening or afternoon or day, depending on your time zone. And hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Really, Thanks. appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. It. Have a great day.